Welcome to this service from Bethel with Trinity Gask and Kinkel for Sunday the 25th of October. Today we're going to sing, Crown Him with many crowns, if though the throne of God above, and mine eyes are seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Our reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 12 to 19. And the Reverend Alec Mitchell is inviting us to think about Jesus as a righteous judge. And I remind you that next Sunday, the 1st of November, we'll be back in the church again in Mutho for our second service since lockdown. If you plan to be with us, you must let us know beforehand that you will be there. And you can find out more on Facebook or on the website about how to contact us or at the end of this service. There will of course also be a YouTube service next Sunday morning for those who are not able to join us. Enjoy the service. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Last week I asked the question, 
who's in control? Who sits on the throne of our world? Whose authority do we live under? The Bible is very clear. Our God reigns. Jesus sits on the throne. He is Lord. I also said that Jesus' kingship was not about lording it over us, not about bossing us around, but it was about trying to win us, woo us, love us into his kingdom, where we then choose to live under his rule, to live the life that he wants us to live, to live as one of his subjects, one of his people, one of his children. I want to pose another question today. Who would you want to judge you? Who would you think would give the best reflection, the truest judgment of your life? I suspect we might say, well, somebody who knows me really well. Someone who has been part of my life. Knows me at my best and knows me at my worst. Someone who can see below the surface of my life. Who knows my heart. Someone I love and someone who loves me. They surely would be the best person to judge me. Whether we like it or not, we are being judged all the time. Our appearance, our manner, age, actions, things we don't do, words we speak. People are observing and passing judgment all the time on us. Social media is awash with trolls. People who make it their life's work to analyse and criticise everyone and anyone. In fact, it's never been easier to judge people than it is today. The Bible speaks very clearly about a day of judgment. That one day there will be a reckoning for this world and its people. Benjamin Franklin speaking in 1789 about the the newly finalised American Convention, the American Constitution. People were saying this was the perfect uh, rule for a country. But Benjamin Franklin said, There is nothing certain in this life except death and taxes. Maybe he should have said, There is nothing certain in this life save death and judgment. Today we read a well-known passage in the New Testament where Jesus clearly acts in some sort of judgment. He sees a wrong, an injustice, and he acts. We'll be reading Mark chapter 11 verse 12 to 19. Mark chapter 11 Verse 12. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it wasn't the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no no one ever eat fruit from you again. 
and his disciples heard him saying it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Amen. By Jesus' day, the temple, sitting at the highest point in the city of Jerusalem, was only a pale shadow of what it had once been. It had been destroyed and rebuilt several times. But even so, it was still the beating heart of Jewish worship and devotion. It was the place you visited in order to meet with the Lord God and most importantly to seek forgiveness for your sins. The 
temple consisted of a series of courtyards and gates, all leading up to the most holy place, the, uh, right at the centre of the temple. And different people could go into different courtyards. But the outer courtyard that features in our reading today, where the action took place, was known as the courtyard of the Gentiles. Non-Jews could move freely through this area. Those who were seeking after the God of Israel but weren't Jews could only get as far as this courtyard. That was the nearest they could be to the God of Israel. But in this courtyard, it was a buzz with trading, buying and selling animals to make offerings for your sins. Animals that you brought as offerings to the temple had to be without defect. They had to be perfect. So often the animal you brought was found to be imperfect. So it was much easier to buy a pre-inspected animal than to run the risk of having yours rejected. So offerings from doves to sheep were on sale in this courtyard. Now, although you could buy them, you couldn't use everyday money. It was polluted money. So you had to change your everyday coinage into temple money, pure money, in order to make your purchase. So what happened was you were literally fleeced twice, changing your money and then buying your goods In 1996, I was walking through the old city of Jerusalem with a few friends, not far from the site of uh, the temple, not far from where this event took place. We were approached by a very well-dressed uh, man offering to buy our, dollar, our, our dollars in exchange for shekels. After speaking to our local guide, we went ahead and did that. We exchanged dollars. We exchanged dollars for shekels. You see, he was offering a far better rate of exchange than we would have got from the bank or a bureau de change. He was quite a different kind of money changer from the ones in the outer court of the temple in Jesus' day. So as we know, as a result of what was going on, Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers and drove all the people out of the courtyard. He said, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The part of the temple which should have been a shop window to welcome all who were seeking the God of Israel was instead a den of robbers. The worshippers who were sincerely seeking after God were being cheated exploited and robbed. Strong vested interests were at work in that courtyard. And the only wrong the chief priests saw was that of Jesus, disturbing the business of the day. Jesus acted in judgment 
a judgment that would ultimately cost him his life. The prophet Habakkuk in the Old Testament, among other prophets, asked the question of God, why do the wicked prosper? Why is there so much unfairness and injustice in the world? And that question asked two and a half thousand years ago is just as relevant today. Even with thousands of years of civilization, this world is still unfair and unjust for many. The Black Lives Matter movement is just one of many manifestations of that feeling. Why do bad people often prosper? I just recently read that Kim Jong-un of North Korea has a private jet, 12 palaces, 100 cars, all for his personal use, while many, many people in his country starve to death. And such inequalities are being repeated around our world. Evil seems to prosper. At a personal level today, people are increasingly resenting any form of judgment, any form of limitation on their behaviour, particularly moral judgment. They want to be their own person, do their own thing without any form of moral or critical judgment. That road can often lead to chaos and anarchy. The problem with judgment of another person is that it can be clouded by looking down a distorted lens. In my late teens, I, I worked in the shop floor of a large, busy, heavy engineering uh, company. It was a tough place to work, but it had lots of characters. There was a man who looked a bit like Charlie Chaplin. He was a labourer with a wheelbarrow who wandered around the factory moving bits and pieces from one place to the next. He was a quiet, polite man, always busy, buzzing around the factory. One of the, the men I was working with saw me looking at him one day and he said to me, I bet you think that he's a really nice man. And I said, yeah, he, he seems to be. He said, well, let me tell you this. See that man? He goes into every pub in Wisha on a Saturday night. My mind began to race. What kind of man was he? Every pub in Wisha on a Saturday night. Was he a drunkard? An alcoholic? A lonely old soul? I later discovered he was in the Salvation Army and he was in every pub selling the war cry. Human judgment can so often be skewed. Yet, without some form of judgment, this world would descend even further into chaos. Without law courts, courts of law, none of us would be safe. You cannot progress in education without some form of judgment being made of your aptitude and ability. 
every professional body, every sporting body in the land, covering things from health to money, from football to tennis, has people sitting in judgment of its members. When I was in Dunfermline, one of my colleagues sat on the British Medical Association uh, Professional Conduct Committee. If judgments are so built into the fabric of our society, and yet there is still unfairness and injustice, then it suggests that human judgment is flawed. It suggests that we need a greater judge, one who understands what it means to be human, to be disadvantaged from birth, born into poverty, unjustly tried by powerful leaders, falsely accused, put to death as a public spectacle. Would that person not be a worthy judge? Jesus not only cleared the temple courtyard, he also spoke about sheep being separated from goats, a judgment process. He talked about bridesmaids who were barred from going into the wedding feast because they weren't prepared, they weren't ready. He was talking about a future day of reckoning, of judgment. Habakkuk got an answer to his question about injustice and judgment. Habakkuk 2 verse 3 Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and not delay. That was God's answer to Habakkuk. Be patient, judgment will come. Surely the only thing which makes sense of our crazy, messed up, unequal world is that one day, perfect judge will set matters straight. As we come to the very end of the Bible, Revelation 20 verse 12, it says there, a revelation of John, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Who would you want to judge you? Are you ready to be judged by a perfect judge? Amen. Let us pray. O Lord our God, we are grateful that the final summing up of our lives will be in your hands. We lay our lives before your loving gaze. What other people think of us no longer matters. And even if our own hearts condemn us, we are assured in your word that our Saviour Jesus Christ has paid the price of our sins. That it is your love that will have the last word. O oh God, if we are self-satisfied, self-righteous, then cut deep into us and reveal your truth to us. If we're feeling a failure, unsure, unworthy to stand in your sight, may the light of your love break through into our lives afresh. If we have gone off the rails, 
and are far from your loving presence. May your Holy Spirit guide and lead us back to your presence. We pray for those whom the world despises, for those who are on the outside of society, for criminals, for those in prison, for those addicted to drugs, for social misfits, for all who feel as if society does not understand them. Lord, help us to relate to all as being ambassadors of Christ, understanding yet not sentimental, strong but not critical, confident of the power of your love to redeem them. We pray for all who have to judge others, for people who conduct interviews, for people who write reports on other people, for teachers and lecturers in our schools, for all who guide and direct the course of education, have to make decisions about exams. Lord, we pray. We pray for our judicial system, for those who work within our courts, both at a local level and at a national level, for those who sit on benches for sheriffs and judges, for court clerks, for all who guide and direct uh, the course of our justice system. Lord, we pray, may your spirit grant them truth, integrity, and mercy. We pray for the people who are critical of us, for those who see our faults and our weak spots, for those who try to make us feel small. In you, O Lord, we put our confidence. May we find our identity in you, May we not fear what others say of us. We pray for our families and friends, for the precious network of loving relationships, those who know the worst and the best about us. May your pure love be at work constantly between us, purifying what is unhealthy, healing the wounds we give each other, keeping us one even when death or distance divide us. We pray for all who suffer in mind or in body. May your healing love radiate from us to them, even as we think of them in silence before you. Lord, help us to live in this world, but not to be shaped by it, not to conform to this world's critical patterns, but to be transformed by the knowledge of your great love for this world and for its people. In your name, O Jesus, we ask your blessing upon this world and its people, upon those nearest to us and those we've yet to know. So Lord, hear our prayers as we ask them in the loving name of Jesus. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and guard you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.